Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Echo Live. My name is Paulette, and I will be doing our program today. We're going to be going back into our virtual planetarium programming, but instead of actually using our virtual planetarium, we're going to talk about some sort of myths and misconceptions around space and space exploration. So we're going to talk about three things in particular today. We're going to talk about black holes. We're going to talk about sound in space. And we're also going to talk a little bit about distances that we have in our solar system and beyond. So like I said, today we're going to be talking about some of those myths and misconceptions that go along with astronomy and space science. So for those of you that have joined us before, you know the drill. Uh, but if you're new um, or if you have joined us before, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, that'll be the way that I can communicate with you throughout our program today. So introduce yourself in the chat and I'll ask questions during the program. Please answer any questions that I ask. And then uh, also if you have any questions during our program, go ahead and put those in the chat and I'd be happy to answer them. You can introduce yourself by telling us your name, where you're from, or what grade you're in, uh, just so we sort of know where our audience base is located. I know we see people from all over the U.S., but it's always great to see uh, some of our friends coming back and joining us. So hi, Evan from Texas. Good to see you back. All right. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about some of the myths, myths and misconceptions about space. Now, you might have at some point seen a science fiction movie, whether it be Star Trek or Star Wars or uh, any of the other science fiction movies. Um, you might have seen some spacecraft flying around, especially when we have a fight scene in those spacecraft, with those spacecraft, we hear Choo, 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 happening in the movie, right? Well, let's go ahead and see an example of this. Uh, I have loaded up uh, a, I've loaded up a little bit of a clip from, if you're familiar with Clone Wars uh, on, uh, on Cartoon Network, you might be familiar with this scene or have seen it before. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to play just a little bit. Of this. I think I might have forgotten to share our computer sound. There we go. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at this again. them by surprise, all right. Now, I know personally when I watch these films, I love the noises and I love making the noises too. Uh, that's why you heard me go pew, pew, pew. It's just fun. Uh, but it turns out that there actually isn't sound in space. Why do you think we wouldn't be able to hear sound in space? What does sound need to move? Why wouldn't we be able to hear sound in space? Now, I have a special little device um, right here on my screen. I actually have two of these devices because I am terrible, terrible at knowing where my keys are located. So we have one of these special little devices right here on my keychain, as you see. And with this, I can make it make some sound. So let me go ahead and uh, make it make some sound. Um, now, sometimes I get to hear that for like 15 minutes while I try and find what I put my keys under. Um, but that is the sound that these, uh, these little things make. Now, Evan from Texas told us that sound moves through the air. And that's exactly right. Sound moves through the air. It also moves through 
solids too. It can move through solids, it can move through liquids, it can move through gases. It just needs some particles or molecules to move because sound waves are transverse. So we have our slinky right here. And we think of waves as our slinky going up and down like this, we make a wave. Let's see if I can get it going fast enough to do too. I can't, the slinky is a little bit too small. So that's what we think of when we think of waves like we think of light waves. But this is something called transverse waves. So this is up and down and we see it as a wave like this. Now, sound waves are actually called, are actually compression waves. And what happens if sound happens on one end, for example, this end right here in my right hand, and those sound waves then move through our slinky back and forth. It goes from whatever our sound source is through the molecules in between. And it actually pushes the molecules together until we get to our, our source that is hearing the sound. So that would be our ears. So sound needs some sort of medium to move through. Whether that medium be air, uh, I don't know if you've ever gone underwater in the bathtub. I love doing that. And then knocking on the side of the bathtub. I love doing that because then the sound is sort of making a different noise, something uh, that we hear it a little bit differently. Another really good thing that we can do and another way that we can make sound travel is actually, actually through a solid. So sound travels through solids even more efficiently than it travels through air. So for example, if we made a, uh, if, we made, if we had a cup, and we connected it to another cup with a string, that sound is actually going to move through that string way more efficiently. So you could whisper into the cup and you'd be able to hear it pretty loudly on the other side. Another way to test this is to actually put your ear down on whatever table or desk you have and knock. you'll hear that the sound that you hear on your table is actually louder when you have your ear pressed up against the table than when you're just knocking and hearing it through the air. Now you guys might be hearing that really loud because our microphone is actually on this table. So anytime I bump something, you're gonna hear it really loud because it's moving through the medium of the table. Now, is there air in space? No, space is actually a vacuum. So there's no air, there's no medium for these compression waves to move down the line. So there wouldn't be sound in space. And I don't want you to just believe me. Of course, we have to do some experiments uh, to see if this is true. So I use my keys to, to show you something. I actually have a second one. I have two sets of keys. And again, I lose them all the time. So I have one of these devices that helps me find my keys. And we're going to get a, let's see, this is my other set of keys. So we'll be able to hear that sound. Coming through in our bell jar right here. Now, if I put it down, it'll get slightly quieter. But that's mostly because we're muffling the sound. So now that we know what it sounds like, on our vacuum plate right here, everybody hears that, right? We're actually gonna suck all of the air out from inside of our bell jar right here. So we're gonna use our handy dandy vacuum pump and we're going to pump all of the air outside of our bell jar and we'll see what happens. Do you hear anything? I must have turned it off. I must have turned it off. Okay. Um, let's try that again. Let's let's see if I actually turned it off. Let's take the, the air that's inside of here 
and suction some of that back in. Oh, it isn't ringing anymore. Okay. So let's try that again. So you can actually see that I have the app right here. I'm going to hit find. There we go, it's ringing again. All right. Hmm, it's still ringing according to my app. So I didn't turn it off. Let me go ahead and introduce some air back into our vacuum chamber. So it was still ringing inside of there. Come on. It was still inside of there. It was still making noises, but we couldn't hear it because there was no medium. Even though I am outside of this vacuum chamber and there's air out here, there wasn't a way for the air to go from the little uh, device that I have inside of there to help me find my keys and the edge of the glass. So we actually weren't able to hear the sound at all because, uh, because it's inside of a vacuum and there's no air to move things around. Um, that is one of the most common myths and misconceptions about space. People think, oh, you know what, space, yeah, there's definitely sound in space. And it turns out there actually isn't. Um, so our friend Evan from Texas, you definitely had it right, because there's no air, there's no medium, and it doesn't really go anywhere. So excellent. All right, so what, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our next myth and misconception. Now this myth and misconception doesn't really narrow it down very much. Um, you might see movies like, uh, let's see, there was a Star Trek movie where they were talking about using dark matter and zapping a black hole. And there was another movie, Interstellar, um, and black holes are just really not understood particularly well. Black holes are areas of infinite density. So that means that mass about the size of our sun, so really, really big, would have to compress down into something about the size of a marble. Maybe a little bit bigger, it could still be a black hole. Black holes then have so much gravity because gravity, the force of gravity, is proportional to the mass over the radius squared. So if you have a huge mass in a tiny radius, the force of gravity is much, much bigger. Now that means and some people think that that means that this black hole is just going to eat everything that comes its way, nom, 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 nom. which is kind of true, but not really. So this black hole has the same gravitational pull as the sun in a much, much smaller area. Now, if you get really, really close to it, yes, it would pull everything in that gets really, really close to it. But what if our sun turned into a black hole? What would happen on the Earth? What do we think? What would happen on the Earth if it tur if the sun turned into a black hole? It would get really cold. It would get super cold. And that's one of the things that we might have to worry about, although our sun won't turn into a black hole. Um, but our Earth would get super, super, super cold. But it would actually stay in the same orbit. So if we replaced the sun with a black hole, we would just go around it like normal because the gravity, the force of gravity is dependent on the mass. It's the same mass divided by the radius squared. And so the radius that you are away from that center of mass 
hasn't changed. So we would just continue to orbit around the sun in sort of the same path that we've been doing. It would just be really, really cold. Um, and we might have some other issues like radiation and, and we would definitely have some other issues if a black hole suddenly appeared where our sun is. So if that black hole suddenly appeared where the sun is, what do you think would happen as we approached it? What do you think would happen as we approached it? If we approached this black hole right here, pretend this is me right here, and I'm approaching this black hole. What happens? We don't know. We are actually not sure what happens to things as they go into a black hole. But we do know something to a point. We know what would happen because of the laws of physics as we approach that black hole. Once we cross that event horizon, we have no idea. But there would something would happen to us as we approached it that's actually kind of cool. So remember, I talked about the force of gravity being proportional to the mass over the radius squared. So as we approached this black hole that we have down here on the table, I'll move my phone out of the way. Let's see, let's go ahead and zoom on in so we can see this a little bit better. There we go. All right, here's our black hole. There is our black hole. It's a pretty fancy black hole. It's a cat's eye marble. <laughs> All right, so if we were this slinky right here, and we approached this black hole, what would actually happen is this black hole right here would pull really, really hard on this part of the slinky and not quite as hard on the other part of the slinky. So the closer you would get to the black hole, the more it would tug because it's proportional to the mass over the radius squared. So the closer we get, the more that we get pulled and we would actually turn into spaghetti. We call it spaghettification because we're getting pulled at the uh, nearer to the black hole. So if we went feet first, our feet would be tugged on harder than our head would be tugged on. So we would just stretch out and spaghettify. Uh, and become uh, a giant piece of, of human spaghetti and probably die uh, many, many times before that <laughs> because that gravity is really, really big. So when we see science fiction movies like Interstellar, as they approach the black hole, I have a hard time believing them sometimes because they don't spaghettify like science tells us we're supposed to. They just go and uh, they just go right into the black hole, into the event horizon. And what happens after they get into the event horizon? I mean, honestly, it's anyone's game. And no one knows what actually happens as they go into that event horizon. So whatever they're talking about could be real, could be made up, probably made up. But we might find out one day that, I don't know, it takes us to the other end of the universe. It takes us to a wormhole and through a wormhole. So that's something that we're sort of really, really unknown about, but we're pretty sure that if you approach a black hole, you would stretch out into a giant piece of spaghetti and go through spaghettification. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about uh, that is sometimes not as well known um, and not really it's kind of hard for us to judge. So distances in space. Distances in space are really hard for us to wrap our heads around. Because when we are here on the Earth, we only have the distance we have on the Earth to gauge things by. So for example, my apartment to the Michigan Science Center is 3.5 miles. And we know how long 3.5 miles are. We can also talk about it in a different unit. We could talk about it uh, when we're talking about time. 
So for me, in a car, it takes me seven minutes to drive from my apartment to the Michigan Science Center. So we have different ways of describing it. So we have our distance, 3.5 miles, our time, but our time also depends on our, how we're traveling. So for example, if I bike to work, it can take me 15 minutes to get from my apartment to Michigan Science Center. So it takes me about twice as long. Now, we tend to talk about things in terms of distances, although here in the Midwest, we do talk a lot about things in terms of time. For example, uh, if I were to go home and visit my parents in Wisconsin, it takes me about eight hours to get there, but it's only about 450 miles or so. So when we talk about things like distance and time on the earth, and distance in particular, we use the unit of miles, at least here in the United States. Some of our friends that might be joining us from Canada or any other part of the world, you probably use kilometers um, because we have those two different units of distance. Um, but here in the US, we use miles and everywhere else in the world, they use kilometers, so kilometers. Um, so when we're talking about something like the distance things are apart from each other in space, it's really hard for us to wrap our heads around. So if we, I don't know, for example, use this marble again. All right, we're gonna use our marble again. And I didn't lose my marbles, at least not yet. So we're gonna use this marble and we're gonna use this ping pong ball as well. Oh, that ping pong ball is very spacey looking uh, because of my green screen. Let's go ahead and turn that off. It is actually almost like the exact same color as my green screen. Uh, okay, so let's turn off our virtual background so we can see this a little bit better. There we go. Okay, so we have our Earth and we have the moon. The moon is about a quarter of the size of the Earth. So this might be a little bit small in comparison, um, but this was the closest thing that I had in our studio. Now, when we're talking about how far apart these things are in space, what do you think? Are they this far apart with 125,000 miles or million miles in between? Are they this far apart? Are they this far apart? Should I put this marble here on the other side of the room? Well, a great way to be able to understand a little bit better about how far away the moon is from the Earth is that the moon is actually uh, 30 Earth cir circumferences away from the moon. The Earth is 30 Earth circumferences away from the moon. So this is something that you can actually try at home. Find something, find two objects, one of them a little bit larger, one of them a little bit smaller. Again, the moon is about a quarter of the size of the Earth. And we can actually figure out how far away our scale distance would be. So we're going to use some ribbon. And what I'm going to do with this ribbon, again, this is something that you can try at home yourself. I'm going to take a piece of ribbon to the earth. So here we have our earth ping pong ball. I'm going to go ahead and tape that piece of ribbon on there. Awesome. Okay. So remember, the moon is 30 Earth circumferences away. So what we can do is we can wrap this ribbon around the Earth 30 times. And we'll be able to see our scale and how far away we should have this. So we've got one. And of course my ribbon is tangled because ribbon is always tangled. All right, one, two, and this can sometimes take a little bit of practice or skill to be able to get the ribbon all the way around 30 times. And 
I even lost count. All right. And notice, this is a lot bigger than you thought it might be. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Starting to get kind of hard to do this. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, all right, we're over halfway, 20, 21, 22, 20, 23, sometimes it flips, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 and 30. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and cut my ribbon after we've made 30 turns. And I'm going to take the other side of this ribbon to my marble. So now we have the distance between the earth and the moon to scale or at least close enough to scale. Now, you can see that there's a lot of ribbon between these two. Let's go ahead and zoom on back out. And there's a lot of ribbon between these two. It's definitely wider than my arm span. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that if I wanted to make sure that I stretched out this ribbon all the way, I would have to go from one side of my room to the other. Look at how much extra ribbon there is here. So even halfway, so maybe uh, two and a half arms length away from me. This is something I encourage you to try at home. Uh, I love doing exploration at home, learning a little bit more. This is a great way to be hands-on and to learn and understand a little bit more about some of our distances that we have in space. And remember, the moon is our closest object. So when we're talking about things in terms of light years, which is, uh, so in astronomical units, which is 93 million miles. And then we talk about things in terms of, uh, so it's, it's 125,000 miles to the moon, 93 million miles to the sun. It's four light years to our nearest star and a light year is over 6 trillion miles. That's insane when we talk about distances out in space. So this is one way to sort of get a better grasp of how far away the moon really is. And now you know why. It took us four days to get out there. So it took them a while to travel because it's a really, really long way. It is not like just traveling and driving out to, for me, my parents' house in Wisconsin. Um, so. Uh, uh, this is a great time to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, we might do a couple more of these where we talk about some of the myths and misconceptions about what you might see in space um, or specifically space movies and just some things that people don't quite know the answers to. Um, so uh, this is also a great time to ask if anybody has any questions. Uh, we also want to thank our sponsors of Ford and Denso. They've been here since the very, very beginning. So we are so grateful for them that we can continue to bring you these programs uh, every, or every Tuesday and Thursday. We will be switching things up shortly. I'll let Anna announce that one next week. Uh, but we're very excited to see everybody every day, be able to answer any questions that you have and to just be able to see some of some familiar faces. So I can see uh, Howard George just joined us. It's great to see you. He's out in uh, Buffalo right now. 
Um, and of course, Evan from Texas, it's great to see you every single week. Um, we are, like I said, getting ready to change over to our fall schedule. Um, but next week, Tuesday and Thursday, you'll see you'll see me back here on Thursday, Anna back here on Tuesday. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be talking about the Northern Lights or the Aurora. So I'm super excited about that. All right, not seeing any questions coming in. Thank you, Justin. Yes, science is amazing. <laughs> Not seeing any other questions coming in. I want to thank everybody and we will see you next time. Bye everyone.